you are on strat news global and our fortnightly program books corner in which we discuss important books around the world and have a conversation uh, with the authors of uh, these books today i am delighted to welcome a uh, luke petty uh, based out of copenhagen who has written a book uh, entitled how china loses uh, which is uh, a quite contrary to normally uh, a lot of books written by different authors across the globe who talk about how china is winning so uh, i was interested in uh, interviewing him uh, he is a researcher uh, he is an author this book was published by oxford university press in january this year and uh, is just about making its way uh, to india i guess uh, after being published in uh, the us and uh, europe or europe and asia perhaps uh, that's where uh, the book stands right now but uh, i had a, a quick read uh, uh, luke was uh, very uh, gracious to share a pdf copy of the book and a fascinating read so welcome uh, to books corner luke uh, and uh, uh, thank you very much for finding time to speak to us Really a pleasure to be here. Thanks. So uh, let me start with the uh, title of the book itself, where you say, um, you know, it's uh, how China loses or why China loses. Uh, very attractive title, and I think uh, first uh, thing when I read, uh, when I got an email from another think tank about your book discussion with them, uh, I was quite interested because it is quite contrary to uh, normally what one reads. uh the literature about china and uh, the people who uh, research on china so what uh, actually was the premise of the book uh, when you actually started uh, researching it and then of course wrote it if you can tell us uh, what was the basic premise i think the the premise of the book is that we live in a world where not only the united states and china matter and i felt that we were being bombarded with with media stories and opinion pieces and research on this US China rivalry that make us believe that if China passes the US in economic power or military power that somehow Beijing alone will dictate the future of the global economy and global affairs that everything else is secondary that India Japan Germany and other major powers lack the agency to to propel change and this isn't to say that the US and China relationship is not important it's the most important bilateral relationship in the world it, together the two countries make up 40% of the global economy they command the world's two most powerful militaries they have impressive technological capabilities but i think we've lost sight of the rest of the world of the six, the other 60% of the global economy the other major militaries the other tech leaders the other cultural hubs and soft powers that will play a instrumental role in shaping the future of how we get out of the covid-19 pandemic how do we address climate change the direction of free trade and how new technologies will shape our societies so this book is not to say that china uh is is not a major power it's a considerable power it wields tremendous influence across the globe but it's not preordained to dominate the future its relationships with the rest of the world matter and when we take a look at china's relations uh with others particularly these middle powers like india and japan we see fraying political ties we see uh trade and investment barriers going up and we see even rising security tensions so i think the other major powers um are recognizing that engaging china has its benefits of course but it also comes with uh challenges trade investment finance and technology cooperation with china can can actually threaten the long term competitiveness of of others and even threaten their foreign and defense autonomy so china has expanded its influence in the world but even in places such as africa latin america and developing asia it's facing new challenges and risks so what you what you are basically saying is that uh, the rise of china is uh, in no doubt but uh, whether china will be the preeminent power uh, in the second half of uh, this century is not a given and therefore uh, it's a fascinating subject to uh, discuss and um, talk and write about uh, where 
some people say america is losing its uh, primacy it is uh, a declining power and at the same time simultaneously uh, the chinese are rising so if that is the uh, basis on which uh, you've uh, sort of uh, gone around and traveled across continents as i can see you've been to uh, south america you've been to asia to japan uh, and uh, of course uh, to other parts of the developing uh, african uh, continent so uh, let me come to africa first before i uh, come to japan and argentina uh, particularly because your chapters uh, focus on that uh, in africa uh, many nations have welcomed the chinese money uh, because it is uh, easy to get and of course uh, that brings in the necessary development but uh, uh, is there uh, not just a debt trap uh, that the chinese are springing there uh, but also the fact that uh, the africans are now starting to realize that uh, they need to push back otherwise uh, their sovereignty and their uh, independence is at stake did you find that uh, sentiment across the continent i think it's important to recognize that um, many africans have a positive view of china um and china has brought considerable new trade investment and finance to the continent uh, there's even lessons i think for other major powers to learn from china in africa and that's primarily to not only see africa as a, as a place of entrenched poverty and humanitarian crisis but also to see africa uh, for its economic opportunity that it has a large young population that it has you know tremendous future consumer market potential and that's something i think that that others can learn from china because that's how china has approached the continent but that being said not everything china touches in africa turns to gold um and just as with other foreign powers on the continent china also brings problems to africa and we need to be honest about those um and you know much of the debate i think in in the us and and india and europe has been focused on whether you know china is locking african countries and and other developing countries into so called debt traps um the other side of the debate sees sees china sort of as just doing business it, that it doesn't have you know much strategic uh, intention behind its interest that its businesses are just expanding around the world that its finance is just expanding and i think you know the the reality in this debate lies somewhere in between um china is not a monolith its ministries its state owned enterprises they don't march to the beat of the drum from beijing all the time they have independent thinking they have commercial objectives um and and there's it's it's not always possible for china to plan and to execute things perfectly um at the same time however you know chinese finance uh is uh challenging the borrowing capacities of many african countries along with the finance from other major powers and chinese loans can encourage local corruption they they can encourage misspending and they make african countries more uh susceptible to chinese influence but ultimately what i think will dictate the future of of china's uh reputation in africa is whether or not these loans which often go to roads and and railways and hydropower dams whether or not this infrastructure finance will actually spur on development uh president xi jinping has has called on africans to step on the express train to china's development but there's a there's a lot of challenges facing uh china's uh finance in africa and i'll, I'll make three points of what those challenges are first we we often hear that there are no political strings attached to china's exactly. uh influence uh to china's uh, loans in africa but we've learned that chinese loans come with considerable economic strings and of course eco- economic trade investment economic influence is connected with political influence so for example the vast majority of chinese finance is conditioned to chinese contractors and chinese products being used to build new infrastructure so from the very beginning china cuts off opportunities for local and regional industry to benefit from this finance secondly we know that developing countries uh need infrastructure to men- tremendously uh, but not any infrastructure at any cost will do infrastructure needs to generate productive activities it needs to spur on uh local business activity it needs to spur on local uh, exports and china doesn't have a track record at home of building productive infrastructure much of china's infrastructure uh doesn't generate new economic activity in china 
And African countries in particular don't, don't have the space to make as many poor decisions as China has on infrastructure. They can't lean back on a massive uh, manufacturing base as China can. So it, African countries are really in a tough position to make the really smart infrastructure decisions um, to avoid financial distress. Finally, you know, many people talked about tens of millions of jobs leaving China and going to Africa as costs, manufacturing costs in China rose. But this isn't taking place. Uh, there are some success stories like in Ethiopia. But most Chinese companies, when they do go abroad, typically go to Southeast Asia or South Asia. So Africa needs to find ways to extract long-term benefits from engaging China. And I think many African leaders are, are quite uh, clear on the fact that they need to engage a diversity of trade and investment partners. They can't put all their eggs in the Chinese basket. And that is why I think uh, that's where India comes in. And the, the, many people have spoken about it. Uh, India is also uh, making a um, lot of attempts to uh, get into Africa through a different model where uh, the uh, decision on what to build, where to build and uh, who uh, will participate is left to the local government, uh, the local uh, authority. And uh, the model is uh, seem to be uh, something that benefits the local people contrary to what the Chinese uh, bringing in their own labor, their own, um, sometimes their own uh, laws uh, that they want to apply in those uh, enclaves. Uh, will uh, India get some kind of a uh, toehold, if not a foothold or uh, a, a entry into Africa with that model? Have you come across any such uh, competition or any such, uh, I would say, um, you know, uh, friction between uh, the uh, friction in their minds of the African leaders where they want to choose between the Indian, so-called Indian model and the Chinese model? I, I think it, it's more the case that African governments aren't interested in saying no to any uh, financial engagement. I think they, you know, they recognize that they don't want to be over-dependent on any foreign partner, uh, China included, of course. So the Indian approach, you know, if it can, if it continues to, to focus on on investment, to focus on 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 sort of uh, manufacturing that that creates new jobs, um, this will be, I think, looked on kindly uh, across Africa. India also has that historical link, particularly in East Africa, uh, that it can bring to the table. But you know, India at the same time doesn't have the same uh, economic uh, you know strength uh, yet um, to to stretch its its trade and investment. Um, so deeply into Africa, so I think you know, India's strategy could be to to engage you know uh, you know the East African region in particular uh, as it as it grows at home and and expand from there. Indeed, uh, in fact, uh, moving uh, focus, shifting focus a little bit. Uh, what about um, the European Union and China relationship? I mean, uh, the recent uh, agreement uh, has evoked uh, mixed reactions. And uh, uh, the future doesn't look very bright for the for that relationship. Uh, where would you put uh, or slot that relationship right now? I think you know the EU is 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 constantly in this sort of uh, you know give and take relationship with China, sort of a cautious relationship, but still wanting to not cut off all its uh, its ties. Uh, it's still wanting to ensure that it can uh, benefit uh, financially. You have you know. A, a difficulty within the EU of of finding you know unity on China, um, but I think you know it's it's unrealistic to assume that all the EU members should should behave the same way towards China. I mean, Hungary and others may 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 water down or block EU policies on China. You know, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel may prioritize short term interests of German automakers over uh, the European Union's political values over the long-term competitiveness of German industry in, 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 in the global economy. But even though these divisions exist, I think the EU has still done much to recognize the challenges that it faces with China. So we've seen just in the last couple of years some, some tremendous changes. And it's not just sentiment, it's real hard policy. This includes uh, an investment screening mechanism that, that the EU passed uh, in 2019 uh, after becoming 
increasingly concerned about Chinese acquisitions of advanced manufacturing and tech companies. And since then, we've seen Germany, Italy, and others block several uh, Chinese investments in those sectors. And the EU is also pursuing new anti-subsidy rules to counter uh, China's use of state support uh, to its companies operating in the EU. So this you know, really limits the possibilities for China to benefit technologically by acquiring European companies. Um, yes, the EU has recently signed a provisional investment deal with China, but the deal needs to be ratified by the European Parliament. It needs to be implemented by China and the EU, and it needs to be enforced. And all these milestones are hardly guaranteed. China has a history of opening up sectors one year to outside investment, and then later advancing new barriers uh, to investment in those sectors and upsetting its investment partners. So what I think is critical in guiding uh, the future of, of EU policy on China is whether European political leaders and policymakers have the strategic sense to look past the special interests of a selected number of large European companies and instead look towards how trade and investment with China actually brings growth and welfare back to Europe. Um, this is sort of the critical question going forward, but, but the facade has been removed. I mean, Europeans understand that China is now a, not only a partner, but also a strategic competitor. And I think we're moving forward under that basis. Indeed. In fact, uh, I think you've said somewhere that uh, the uh, uh, business interests are not necessarily national interest in Europe. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, that brings me to uh, the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. It is uh, she, President Xi Jinping's signature project. Uh, he has uh, really uh, staked a lot there, not just financially, but uh, his own prestige. Uh, where do you think the BRI is going and uh, is it going to be uh, the model or do you think it is, a, uh, it is the competition between uh, the uh, rules-based order and the Chinese uh, way of doing business or uh, creating development models? Is that uh, the clash that you envisage or, or that clash is already happening? I think, you know, the, the Belt and Road initially, um, since it was launched by China in 2013, very much had a, a strong economic and infrastructure thrust. Uh, it, it didn't have a strong ideological uh, bent to it. But within that economic and infrastructure engagement, indirectly comes the ideology. So countries that sign up to it, for example, uh, Argentina, uh, Kenya, um, countries that are taking Chinese finance, uh, often have to change local laws to ensure, for example, that there are no public tenders on construction projects, on railways and roads that China's building. And this changes politics when you change laws. Uh, it changes governance. It changes you know, what, how these countries functioned before. So it's, it, China doesn't have a program where it's uh, uh, trying to spread its ideology directly, but through its economic links, it has a way of changing changing politics. But we've seen really a sharp drop uh, in Chinese finance uh, of late through the Belt and Road, particularly in Latin America and Africa. Uh, and this was you know, the trend even before uh, COVID-19 hit. Um, so the, I think the, the, the first act of this Belt and Road play is coming to an end, the Infrastructure Act. Uh, China, of course, will still fund infrastructure, but I don't think at, at the levels it did uh, in previous years. There's a new act to the Belt and Road, and that is a digital one, that is a more technological focused one, that is maybe a green one, that is a health Belt and Road. And therefore it's critical, I think, that, that other major powers, including India, including the US, uh, do something else, uh, that they don't leave uh, the developing world uh, empty of engagement. Uh, it's necessary, not, it's, it's not necessary to, to counter China head on. Um, China has capabilities that other major powers don't have, particularly in, in heavy industries. But we shouldn't be absent of the playing field if you're a European major power or, or India or, or the US, uh, that engagement needs to be there. And it started to come. I think the, uh, we've seen, particularly under the Biden administration, a new attention to, to America's presence in, 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 in Asia in particular. So it's essential 
um, that that the other major powers uh, don't just sit on their hands where the Belt and Road is concerned. Indeed. So one final question. Uh, like I had posed the same question to uh, another academic, uh, of course, diplomat turned economic uh, economist uh, or an author, Kishore uh, Mahbubani, who wrote How China Wins. Uh, I am asking you, is China losing? I think the current direction of China's foreign policy very much threatens uh, the, the rise of its future power. Um, this doesn't mean that China is going to fade away. China is a considerable power. But when uh, Beijing is picking fights with uh, pretty much all the other major powers out there, uh, of course, the United States, uh, upset relations with Europe, upset relations with Canada, Australia, uh, a border skirmish with India, which is likely one of the biggest foreign policy blunders that China's made of late. I think that doesn't uh, bring out sort of a, 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 a very optimistic future uh, for China's uh, uh, global power, uh, that it, it's going to run into more walls if it's picking fights with those others. Um, and, you know, the Quad, this quadrilateral security dialogue that the US, uh, India, Japan, and Australia are part of, this, this is a perfect example. It has grown um, as China has been more assertive in its military co coercion, its economic coercion. And it's not something that is necessarily just cooked up in Washington, D.C. Uh, there are a lot of, you know, cooks in that kitchen, um, and and Japan in particular was one of the first movers all the way back in 2007. Yes. Shinzo Abe, Shinzo Abe visited India and and brought up this idea of of of, of a, a, a wider Asia um, uh, that India and Japan in particular could work more closely together. And we've seen Japan and India improve their ties, particularly under Prime Minister Modi. Uh, we've seen India become closer to Australia as well. And this is something that isn't, you know, the strings of, of Washington stretching uh, across the world to pull on the, the, these Asian arms. Th this is something that uh, is very much organically Asian. It's a response to China's behavior. Um, you know, I, I don't see China uh, doing what it can, uh, should be able to do technologically if it cuts off India. Uh, India's population, 1.3 billion. How do you yes. become a global tech leader? How do you become yes. a global tech leader without India on board? So True. I don't think China's destined to lose, but it's upsetting its future rise by picking these fights with so many major powers. Yeah, so uh, the destiny, China's destiny is in its own hands, I suppose. And uh, let us watch uh, over the next decade uh, how it... Uh, takes that trajectory, whether it loses or whether it wins. But uh, maybe a decade down the line, we'll have a chat again. <laughs> but um, that is how your next book may be. Uh, maybe you want to confirm that. But thanks very much for your time and for this chat and all the insights uh, that you gave us about uh, China's rise and China's spread across the globe. Thanks, Liu. A real pleasure. Thank you so much. Pleasure.